All right, Acts 23. So, to catch you up quickly, we know the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Jesus ascends into heaven. He gives the Holy Spirit. We see the birthing of the church. We see the church growing. We see churches being planted. But with the blessings and the growth of the church, we also see the persecution of the church. In the last several weeks, we've been seeing the Apostle Paul who had a burden for his brethren in Jerusalem. You know, as we know, Paul was on his road to Damascus, uh, on his way to, you know, capture and potentially kill more Christians. He held the coats while Stephen was stoned. He was the arch enemy of the Christian church. He got knocked off his high horse. He came to know Jesus Christ. And he went from the arch enemy of Christianity to one of the most sold out believers who's ever lived. And praise God that God can do that in all of our lives. Amen. He could take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He could, no one's beyond salvation. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing Paul, who was told as he had a heart to go to Jerusalem, as he had a heart to go and minister to his people. You know, can you imagine how disappointed he must have been early on? Because he was a Pharisee. And he was a a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he was zealous for for the law. And he thought, no doubt in his mind, that, you know what, I came to know that Christ is the answer. He's the Messiah we've been looking for. He is the one we've been looking for. And no doubt he probably, if I go talk to the guys I went to seminary with, if I go talk to my own people, no doubt I'll be able to enlighten them to the truth. But that wasn't the case at all. The Lord sent him to the Gentiles instead. But even as God's using him to reach the Gentiles, Paul had a continued burden on his heart for his own people. How many can relate to that? You share your faith with others, but you got a family member. You got people that are close to you that still don't know the Lord. It's amazing how sometimes the hardest people for us to share with are the people closest to us. Can we say amen to that? Sometimes they don't want to hear it. Oh, I knew you win. And so Paul now has gone to Jerusalem knowing he was told repeatedly by, by both prophets and other believers, if you go to Jerusalem, torture's waiting for you. And what did Paul say? It's one of my life's verses, Acts 20, 24. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself nothing's going to move him from what he's called to do. And I think part of the reason that we struggle so much in sharing our faith is, and so much in living out loud for the Lord is we lose perspective. And Paul had one perspective and one heart and one desire, and that's to see people saved. Do you know that it's more important that people come to know Jesus than who wins this stupid football game today? Can we say amen to that? This is a guy who played college football. I love football, but it's nothing compared to Jesus. Amen. By the way, I'm rooting for the Eagles. Their quarterback wants to become a pastor after he is done with football. So I just became an Eagle fan today. Amen. <laughs> Root for him. But here's the point. The point is that with, with a, a, an obligation in your heart, you do things you know, begrudgingly. Is it an obligation to share your faith? And for a lot of people, that's how, it, oh, I guess I better share my faith here. Oh, here's an opportunity. And, there's, and, it, and it comes with drudgery. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a get to, it's a have to. The apostle Paul was so in love with Jesus, he wanted everybody to know about him. Amen? And it wasn't a have to, it was a get to. And as we saw, he got, gets to Jerusalem, and sure enough, he... As soon as he gets there, the opposition rises up, and as we saw in chapter 21, they were going to beat him to death. And the only thing that's, that saved him was God sent a, a soldier, some soldiers to stop them. And as he was being carried away, you know, blood dripping from his face, being beaten nearly to death, and they're carrying him up to the barracks, you know, they're having to carry him away. They're surrounding him so the crowd doesn't kill him. And what does Paul do? He stops and says, this is a good-sized crowd. Can I talk to these people? Look, he saw beatings as an opportunity for the gospel. He saw opposition as an opportunity to share the truth. And so last week, we saw him do the same. He gets up in front of the crowd, and what did he share? If you guys remember, what did he share last week? His testimony. testimony. He was watching online, and he remembers. (laughs) God bless you, Terry. What did he share? He shared his testimony. And I encouraged all of you last week, if you didn't do it last week, pray about doing it this week. Have you ever sat down and written out your testimony? Can I encourage you to do that? Paul said, here's who I was, and then I met Jesus, and here's who I am now. And what I love about being able to share your testimony is nobody can refute it. Amen? 
And often they're going to recognize it. Yeah, I knew you when, and now you've met Jesus, and this is who you are now. And it's not because I read a self-help book. It's not because I tried harder. It's because Jesus Christ came into my life, and the Holy Spirit now lives inside of me. So I'm a new creation in him, and everything about me has changed. Can we say amen to that? And guys, so he shares his testimony. And they listened. When he talked about... Jesus, they did, you thought they would pop a cap. And he started saying, I met Jesus, and then I was changed. But what word did he use that got them all fired up? Who remembers? Gentiles. And I go to the Gentiles, oh, and everybody lost their minds. And you know what? He's trying to bring unity, because guys, we're neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, barbarian nor Scythian. We're all one in Christ, amen? When it comes to our salvation, it's Christians and unbelievers. That's the dividing line. We're all one in Christ. We all have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us. So the chapter ended, and they were about to scourge Peter to get him to confess his, what he had done wrong. The commander couldn't understand. Don't you love hearing the children sing praise songs back there? I love it. That doesn't bother me one bit. If it bothers you, you need to get saved or something, okay? <laughs> So the reality is, the reality is that here's Paul, and they're going to beat him to make him confess what he's done wrong when he's done nothing wrong. And they would have beaten him to death, because when they scourged Jesus, it was 40 lashes minus one. But in this case, to examine you under scourging means we're going to scourge you until you fess up. And Paul had nothing to fess up, so they were going to kill him. And then Paul turned as they're tying him up to the post and says to him, are you allowed to just beat a Roman for any reason like this? Is this okay for you to do this? And the guy said, oh, I became a Roman at a great price. And Paul said, well, I was born a Roman. And the guy panicked and they unchained him and they let him go. But, but at the same time, they couldn't let him go. Now they're gonna send him to the religious leaders. So what do you think Paul's thinking? I have the crowd to talk to. Yeah, they beat me up, but I got to share Jesus. I got to share my testimony. Now he's gonna go stand in front of the religious crowd. What do you think's on Paul's mind? opportunity for the gospel. Praise God, more people to talk to. And I pray that, you know, my heart, that that would be my attitude. How about you? A flat tire is an opportunity to tell the guy in the tow truck about Jesus. Amen? That the trials of this life are ordained by God and nothing happens by chance. There's no coincidences. They're divine appointments and we need to learn to praise God for them. Amen? All right. So if you have your outline, grab it and then we'll Look at the text that we're going to look at this morning, and then we will dig in. So I titled the message, Bound by Love, Not by Law. Paul loves to share his faith, not out of obligation, but out of love for the Lord and the people Jesus died for. I was sharing earlier with a few people that I had a tough week at work and most of them have a full-time job and we're going through a transition and I'm dealing with new people in positions of, that they, they're not qualified. To be. But bottom line is, in talking to them, I was beginning to get frustrated, especially with one young lady who's brand new to our company and I'm trying to explain something to her and my biggest customer is trying to spend another couple hundred thousand dollars with my company and she won't process a contract because she doesn't understand. And it's first come, first serve and I'm getting a little... Um, anxious with her and speaking very directly to her. And I'm like, look, you're new here. I know what I'm talking about. Just do it. And I just went on and on. And then the Lord convicted me. You need to pray for her. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And too often when we look at difficulties in life, we forget that really the number one reason we're having this interaction is so that I can represent Jesus to this person. Amen. And I fail at that sometimes. Can anybody else say amen besides me? So Paul now looks as this is an opportunity, and he's bound not by the law, not feeling like I have to do this. That's what he was doing before. But now, as a new creation in Christ, what we do for the Lord, we do because we love him. And it's a get to, not a have to. So the first thing we're going to see, and we're going to see these in Paul's life, when you share the truth, it's going to produce division. Expect it. Amen? There are going to be people that want to hear it, but there are going to be people that don't want to hear it, and they're not going to respond too well. By the way, have we learned that is more true than ever now that there's this thing called social media? Amen? Put something up about Jesus, and you'll find out. Talk about the Lord out loud, and you'll find out. And you know, you'll get unfriended. 
If they unfriend me, they were never my friend to begin with because they knew where I stood with Jesus before this whole thing started. Amen? But the reality is that when you preach the truth, there's going to be division. Secondly, as you share the truth, you'll be encouraged by the Lord. Can we say amen to that? You know, there's times when you step out in faith, you get out of your comfort zone, you feel a little uncomfortable, but when you do it out of love for the Lord and you share for the Lord, you know what? He's gonna come alongside you and encourage you and strengthen you to do what he's called you to do. Number three, there will be those who try to silence the message. Boy, we're living in a world that wants to do that right now, amen? Our country's never been more divided. We are so divided. Congressmen were high-fiving that they voted down getting rid of abortion after 20 weeks. How evil is that? Amen? You're high-fiving that we can continue to murder children that would live outside the human body. And this is the world we live in today. And when you stand for the truth, the Word of God, and what the, the principles the Word of God teaches, you will not have people that want to silence you. Paul's going to have people that say, I'm not going to eat until he's dead. That's devotion. Amen? I hope they had a big breakfast because guess what? It took a while. Now, finally, it didn't happen. Finally, with divine calling comes divine protection. Do you know that we're indestructible until God's through with us? Can we say amen to that? And God, you know, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna go to heaven one second before or after God divinely, dis, it, you know, sovereignly wills for my life and for yours. And so as believers, we don't have to be afraid. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So let's begin there, looking at bound by love, not by law, sharing of truth that, again, is going to produce division. Look what it says there in verse 1 of Acts chapter 23. And then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God to this day. Man, there's a lot in this verse. First of all, the council he's talking here is the Sanhedrin. It's a 71 member court, Supreme Court of Israel, if you will. 70 members plus the high priest. And so he's got the religious leaders of the day, of the people that he is burdened for. And no doubt in his mind, Lord, if I can bring them the truth and their hearts will change, then they will be able to treat, teach the truth to everyone else. This to Paul is a wonderful opportunity. And I want you to notice how he addresses them. He's going to get after them in a few verses, but right here he addresses them with respect. He speaks to them with familiarity. We've talked about this often when you share your faith with somebody. Find a common ground. Amen? Don't water down the truth ever, but find an area where you have some commonality. You know, like I said, when people come knock on the doors, when the cultist knocks on my door and I get them from time to time, uh, I start off with, wow, you really believe, you believe in God. Yes. And you recognize that you need to, you know, to ha you want to have a relationship with him. Yes, that's our common ground. Well, let's talk about our, you know, let's talk about Jesus then. And so Paul finds a common ground, but I want you to notice what he says here. He calls them men and brethren. Now, the way that the Sanhedrin were addressed by the Jews, they called them fathers. And he doesn't call them that. He calls them men and brethren. I think that's significant because I believe it points to the fact that he was one of them. You know, they called each other brethren. And he was one of these, I believe, one of these, these religious leaders. He was in this position of great authority. So now he's coming back to those who knew him when he was maybe the most zealous of all of them. The one that was most aggressive in going after Christians. And now he stands before them, no doubt still dripping with blood from the previous incidents. No doubt maybe bl black and blue. And he's standing up in front of them. And here's an opportunity. And he's going to address them first with a, a heart of kindness. But also we're going to see with sincerity and he will not water down the truth. So he looks earnestly at them. So two riots and a near scourging since his arrival in Jerusalem now results in Paul being, bought, being brought before this Jewish Supreme Court. And Paul looks into the eyes of these religious leaders, some of which he had no doubt served alongside before his conversion. So Paul has a supernatural burden for them. He looks them in the eye earnestly. He's going to speak directly to their hearts because he cares about them. Paul is not trying to win an argument. He wants to win souls. Amen? And too often, I think the debate comes and we're just trying to prove ourselves right. And Paul's heart is, look, I don't care if I win anything. I just want to see you come to know Jesus the way that I have. 
I want you to go from being a, a man who's religious and lost to coming to know the true and living God. And so he's sharing with them from a, a sincerity, from a heart of sincerity. He's looking me in the, in the eye. He cares for them. He loves these people and he loves them because the Lord loves them. Brethren, again, implies that he had been a part of the group. And he says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. The first time you read that, doesn't it kind of shock you a little bit? Because what was he doing when he was on the road to Damascus and what had he been doing for years before that? What was he doing? He was persecuting Christians. He was holding the coats while they stoned Stephen to death, more than likely egging him on. And now he says, I stand in good conscience before God until this day. How is that possible? Let me tell you how it's possible. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Can we say amen to that? The enemy loves to remind you of who you were before you knew Christ. They love to get you looking back on your past. You know what, here's the reality. In our past, we're all sinners in desperate need of a savior. Can we say amen? amen. Well then Jesus came and now we're new creations in Christ. And too often we allow the enemy to, you know, to, in the world to try to define us by our past. It's not who I was, but it's who I am in Christ that matters. Amen? So he says, I stand here in good conscience. That's a powerful picture. It says in Acts twenty two sixteen 16 last week, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul had good and clear conscience because his sins had been forgiven. Because he was now identified as who he was in Christ. He's no longer Saul of Tarsus chasing after Christians. He now goes by, his name's the Apostle Paul being used mildly by God. By the way, I want to say this, and it just came to mind right now. Too often, even Christians will do this. I'm in therapy dealing with my past, and I've been going for 10 years to a therapist to deal with my past. Can I encourage you something? It's been dealt with at the cross. Amen. It is finished we don't need to keep going back and meditating on it. You're a new creation in Christ. Can we say amen? amen. Biblical counseling is good. I believe in we should counsel, we should seek counsel, we should seek godly wisdom, but don't let the enemy have you camping out in who you were. You're not that person anymore. Amen. Be encouraged. So Paul's testimony Cut short the day before when he mentioned the word Gentiles, Paul's going to speak with a personal approach to these men and brethren, finishing up his testimony with the result of Christ's work of forgiveness in his life. His sins have been washed away. He had a good and clear conscience. Peace with God is only possible through the shed blood of Jesus. Guys, if you don't know Jesus, you'll never have peace. Amen? Remember the old bumper sticker, K-N-O Jesus, K-N-O W Jesus, K-N-O W peace, N-O Jesus, N-O peace. If you know the Lord, you can have peace, and apart from him, there is no peace. Can I ask you this morning, do you have a good and clear conscience before God this morning? Clear conscience is a soft pillow, amen? The reality that we, of who we are in Christ, not that I, how many of you sinned yesterday? So I'm not saying sinless before God. We don't qualify. But clear conscience before God because my sins are forgiven. Amen? When the Father sees me, he sees me, he sees you through the shed blood of the Son. If you've been born again, we have a clear conscience before God because of who we are in Christ. Paul had been forgiven, and because he had been forgiven, he had a clear conscience before the Lord. Verse 2, and the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. He's, all he said is, <laughs> what did he say that was so offensive? I have lived with all good conscience before God. So the high priest says, smack him. Paul is just like the most battered guy in the Bible. Everywhere he goes, he starts a revival or a riot or both. Amen? And everywhere he goes, he's getting beaten. He's been beaten with rods and day and night in the ship, in the shipwrecks and in the heat and in cold. You know, you've read it. And here he is now. He stands there. He just begins to address him. And the high priest tells him to go smack him in the mouth. So he comes over. Paul is just sharing the truth. Here's the high priest who's supposed to serve as God's representative to men. But guess what? There's one high priest in this story, but it's not Ananias. It's Jesus. Amen. Who's our great high priest? We don't have any more high priests anymore. Can we say amen to that? There's one. It's the Lord. 
But we're going to notice how Paul is still, just like before, remember when he said, we don't have to, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved, we don't have to keep the law, but then they asked him if he would keep the law when he got to Jerusalem, if he would pay the debt for the four men who were you know, making an oath, and Paul said he would, and he joined them in it. Now, he didn't do it to earn salvation, he did it to earn an audience to minister to the people. I will be all things to all people that I might win some. So here he knows his audience. The high priest has him hit in the mouth, commanded to strike him. By the way, it was an illegal act, keeping up with Ananias' character. Uh, no formal charges, no, con- you know, no convictions. And the pro-Roman policies had alienated him from the Jewish people or murdered him at the outset later on, Ananias. This guy was a a mess. One of the cruelest and most corrupt high priests had priests judge sacrifices as flawed so he could make money. You bring your sacrifice in, oh, that one's flawed. You you gotta buy ours, it's 10 times the amount. Give me the money. This guy was flawed. He was an ungodly man, but he was serving in a position that had once been the position God anointed that had now been replaced by Christ. So he tells him to smack him, to strike him, the word in Greek uh, literally is the same word that was in, used in 21 about the, when the mob was beating him. It was no sl- mere slap. It was a vicious blow to his face. Now, how does Paul respond? Look at verse 3. Then Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Boy, from men and brethren to God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Tones change pretty quickly. Now, Paul while a man of God was also a man. And Paul, I believe, you know, he gets angry here. I believe he's speaking with authority and power. But look what he says. For you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? See, the guy who thought he was the head of the law didn't know the law as well as Paul did. And Paul said, you're commanding me to be hit, and you're supposed to be the one who stands for the law, and you're doing something contrary to the law. Now, by the way, this whitewashed wall, where did we hear that before? Who said that? Jesus. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You think Paul was thinking about this when he said it? I do. Outwardly, look at you, Mr. Religious Man. Inwardly, you're filled with dead men's bones. You're a hypocrite. Paul's calling this man out. Jesus, though, when he was struck this way, calmly reacted by asking a question. If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Uh, Paul is not Jesus. Amen? I believe Paul has righteous anger in a sense, but he doesn't respond the same way the Lord does. Now watch verse four and five. Watch what happens. And it's interesting how Paul is gonna respond to this. It says in verse four, being reminded here, sharing the truth is gonna produce division. Verse four, it says, and those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So Paul didn't know he was the high priest, Paul knew many of these brethren. He didn't know this. Why did he not know this guy was the high priest? Why do you think? They're all probably dressed the same. I'll tell you why. I don't think he was acting like a high priest. Amen? Why would you think this guy's the high priest when he's telling someone to haul off and smack somebody in the mouth when he's, again, actions not of those of a high priest? Guys, as Christians, we represent Christ. Amen? Some said, well, maybe Paul didn't recognize him because we know Paul had a thorn thorn in his flesh and some people thought because he was blinded, his eyesight wasn't that good. It could have been that, but I don't think so. I think it's the actions that made him think this was not the man that he was supposed to be. I can think of a few things worse than if you live in such a way that when someone finds out you're a Christian, they're shocked. Can we say amen to that? When I worked in San Jose in my office, we had a bunch of artists that all sat together. We had a guy in the office who was a known philanderer and would go out and get drunk at lunchtime and was always flirting with the women and he's got a foul mouth on him. And I was talking to a bunch of the artists about the Lord one day and a guy came walking up and he goes, oh yeah, man, I'm a Christian too. <laughs> and two of the artists fell out of their chairs laughing and were laying on the ground laughing so hard that he said he was a Christian. 
And I said, bro, that's kind of rough because if you're truly saved, this is what people think. Amen? Guys, I pray that if, if people at your work found out you were saved tomorrow, I hope they wouldn't be shocked. Amen? Amen? And if you've been working there more than a week, they should know already. Amen? So Paul says, well, yeah, you're not supposed to strike those in authority. Notice he says, it is written. Where does Paul get his authority from? The Word of God. Amen? It is written. You're not supposed to speak evil of those that are in authority. And I, I want to encourage us as Christians that we should do the same. We need to pray for people in authority we might disagree with, but let's not speak evil of them. Can we say amen to that? I don't, I don't have to agree with everything they do. I'm going to pray for them. They need to know Jesus. So Ananias was not acting like a high priest. He uses biblical authority to respond to them. Now watch verse 6. Here's some wisdom. Ananias has an oddy attitude, an illegal act, conceived, uh, you know, convinced Paul that he would not receive a fair hearing before the Sanhedrin. So here's what he says. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out to the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee concerning the hope of the resurrection. This is why I am being judged. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees did not. You've heard me say it. I was a youth pastor, so forgive me. The sad you sees were sad, you see, because they did not believe in the resurrection. And I don't understand why you would even be a religious person if you didn't believe in life after death. If you didn't believe in the resurrection, if you didn't believe in things supernatural, what the heck? I don't, is this Elks Club? What do we got going here? I don't get it. So he pits the Pharisees against the Sadducees by saying, I'm a Pharisee, and half in the room. Now, isn't it interesting? The Pharisees and Sadducees agreed with each other on nothing except for their equal hatred for Jesus. And isn't it amazing how people who have nothing in common will come together to oppose the Savior of the world and those that follow him? Can we say amen to that? And here they are, Nothing in common, but now they're going to, he's going to divide them. I'm a Pharisee, and they're after me because I believe in the resurrection. And the Pharisees are going to start defending Paul. They're going to defend him. Because even though they don't believe in Jesus, even though they reject Christianity, they do believe in the resurrection. And so now they're going to get caught up and start arguing with the other guys in the room. It's going to bring division it's going to bring opposition when you preach the truth. Verse 7 and 8. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Do you know that the cultists don't agree with each other? They're all wrong, and they all have different beliefs in the way that they're wrong. And Paul is speaking the truth, and in so doing, all of a sudden, there's division in the crowd that he is speaking to. The Pharisees would tend to be legalistic and self-righteous and proud, but they believed in the resurrection, and the Sadducees did not believe an absolute essential to Christian doctrine. Again, the res by the way, the resurrection is still under attack in churches today. You know that, right? There were those who say, well, we don't really know that the resurrection happened. If the resurrection didn't happen, game over. Amen? If there's no empty tomb, there's no church. There's no heaven, there's no salvation, there's no redemption, there's no forgiveness. Can we say amen to that? So when people attack the essentials of the Christian faith and they call themselves a church in doing so, uh, they've lined themselves with cultists and, it's in, and they're not a church. Amen? Now watch what happens. Verse 9. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes and Pharisees and party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man. Who's saying that? Pharisees. They reject Jesus. They were crying out, crucify him when he was crucified. They're giving letters to go out and attack Christians. But now because the resurrection is an issue, they say we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Praise God that Paul spoke the truth and that they were at least willing now to maybe listen. Don't be surprised 
that even some of the hardest hearts and the people that you think would be the most difficult to talk to about the Lord, if you would just speak the truth in love, how amazing that God can take any heart, any heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. Amen? Now, that's not what's really going to happen here, but at least as Paul is speaking the truth, it's bringing division, and it's, again, at least to a point to say, well, we shouldn't fight against God. Amen to that. And again, that resurrection is still something that is debated today. Finally, verse 10 in Sharing the truth will produce division. Now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to, uh, to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. How many times are we going to see this? Everywhere Paul speaks, people want to kill him. Most of us, if that was the case, we would stop speaking. Amen? He was stoned to death, I believe, outside of Lystra. God raises him from the dead. He goes right back into the city, starts preaching the gospel again. Everywhere he went, beaten with rods, stoned. And you know what? You can't stop him. You've heard me say it. He's a fanatic for Jesus, right? Amen? You know what a fanatic is? He, he, won't, uh, he won't change the subject, and you can't change his mind. Amen? You can't change his mind, and he won't change the subject. Paul is not going to stop preaching the gospel. There's nothing that can stop him. He's got a one-track mind. He's so burdened for people. He so much loves the Lord. He's not worried about his own life. You couldn't threaten him with heaven. Amen? And so Paul, yet again, the soldiers have to go down and rescue him. Isn't it amazing how God will use worldly things even to protect his people? Amen? Couldn't he have just pick Paul up and moved him to a mountain somewhere? Couldn't he have just dragged? But God uses the command. Now, why is that? I believe it's because there's going to be divine appointments with some of these people that are protecting Paul. Amen? Paul will get chained up. Click, click. Got you for 12 hours, bro. I'm going to give you the gospel. (laughs) Amen? Captive audience. Where are you going? Amen? And so everything was an opportunity, and we need to look for divine appointments in every aspect of life. So bound by love, not by law, sharing the truth will produce division. Again, the truth of the gospel produces a reaction, even among those who consider themselves to be religious. There will be division over essentials of the Christian faith, and those with nothing else in common will come together in opposition to Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. Point number two, as you share the truth, you'll be encouraged by the Lord. Look at verse 11. But the following night, the Lord stood by him. If you underline stuff in your Bible, the Lord stood by him would be a good thing to underline. Isn't it good to know when everyone is against you, if you're standing for the Lord, the Lord stands with you. Amen? Amen? You plus God is a majority. If God is for you, who can be against you? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. When you know that you're standing, it's the reason that David could go out and fight 11 foot, 750 pound Goliath when the entire army was cowering. Why? Because he had the Holy Spirit in him. And he didn't see a big man against a small boy. He saw a small man against an almighty God. And the reason that we struggle in life is we view things from our perspective instead of the Lord's. Our God, your your trials are only great if your God is small. We serve a great God. Can we say amen to that? And so the Lord stands by him. And even though we don't see it here, I think Paul could use a little the Lord putting his arm around him right about now. Can we say amen? He was a mighty man of God, but he was a man. And he's been beaten repeatedly. By the way, Anybody gotten saved so far that we know of? No. And couldn't it be frustrating? You're laying your life on the line and no one's responding. But Paul understood that, you know, the results are not up to us. Those are up to God. But obedience is is up to us. We need to obey, amen? And when we obey, we're obedient. God is glorified and we get blessed. And Paul no doubt could be discouraged yet another night in the barracks, another night surrounded by soldiers being drug away one more time, getting smacked in the mouth one more time. You know, his wounds haven't even healed. And the Lord comes and puts his arm, the Lord stands by him. And he says to him there, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness 
at Rome. The Lord is letting him know that, yeah, you've bore witness of me here, and I'm not done with you yet, Paul. You're going to end up in Rome sharing the gospel there as well. He's a Roman citizen. He was born in the Roman province, Tarsus, part of Rome. And he said, you're going to go and minister. You, got to, you minister to people that you care about, the religious leaders, and you're going to have an opportunity to minister to the people in Rome as well. Boldness does bring persecution. But again, we're indestructible until God's through with us. They couldn't do anything to Paul unless God allowed it. Amen? By the way, I just heard this this morning. 160 people a day are imprisoned for their Christian faith. 160 people a day. When was the last time we prayed for them? Amen? There's people sitting in prison right now because they love Jesus. I don't pray for them enough. How about you? You know what? Let's pray right now. Yes. Amen? Heavenly Father, we come before you. And those who are in prison because of your name, we ask that you would comfort them you would minister to their hearts, that they would know your presence and your peace. Lord, give them opportunities to speak for you. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bring freedom. But Lord, if you want to use them in jail, give them the strength while they are there. Bring divine appointments, Lord, and may we be faithful to pray for our brothers and sisters in chains as your word commands us. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. So Paul's divine appointment, first, Bound by love, not by law. He shares the truth. It produces division. As you share the truth, you'll be encouraged by the Lord. Here the Lord comes alongside him. Paul, I know you haven't seen fruit. I'm not done with you. Paul, I still have more in mind for your life. The Lord stood by him. You look throughout the Bible, and when people are being used by the Lord, they come under attack, but they're never alone. Most of you know one of my favorite pictures in the Bible, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Don't you love that? Everybody bow when you hear the music to the golden idol. Not bowing. Hey, to most wise men you brought down from Israel aren't bowing, king. They drag him in and he yells. I just envision his neck, you know, the vein in his neck just popping out, don't you? King Nebuchadnezzar. Ah, you know. And it, you know, if you, you know, give you one more chance, right? And then he says, I just, uh, who is a God that will deliver you out of my hand? And then they just respond. Oh, God will deliver us, and even if not, we're never going to bow. He's not going to. And King Nebuchadnezzar says, heat it up seven times. How hot does fire need to be to burn? I'm just curious. <laughs> heat it up seven times. He's so angry. To, ah, who is the God? Watch what happens. They open the fire up. It's so hot it burns all the soldiers. That's one thing seven times hotter did do, killed his own men. And then they throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. It's a kiln. You look through the side, and Nebuchadnezzar looks through the side and says, didn't we throw in three bound, and now there are four walking around loose, and the fourth one is in the likeness of the Son of God? And he went from, who is the God that will deliver you out of my, to come out, come out, you servants of the Most High God, <laughs> in a matter of minutes. And don't you love they had to be called out of the fire? I don't touch fire for long. How about you? Ow! You know why? Because it's better to be in the fire with Jesus than out of the fire without him. Amen? And I love this picture because, guys, when we go through trials, the Lord is with us. He stands by us. He's for us. We're never alone. If you do it in your own strength, you'll never have victory. But if you do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, he can do all, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? I'm going with you, Paul. I'm not done with you, Paul. Be of good cheer. Be encouraged. Point number three, there will be those who try to silence the message. Now watch what happens. Paul's simply preaching the truth. Verse 12, and when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. I'm not going to eat again until that guy's dead. That's devotion. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to drink. Like I said, they better have had a big breakfast because it ain't going to happen. Watch verse 12. It says there, now there were more than 40 who formed this conspiracy. So 40 men so hated Paul, they conspired not to eat or drink. And again, friendship with God is enmity with the world. And these religious men, again, cried out for Jesus' death. And now they're conspiring to kill Paul. Religious means nothing. 
There are all kinds of religious people that are lost. Can we say amen to that? The word religion, I love what origi- in the original language it means, it relingara, it means to relink. It's relinking sinful man back to holy God. Praise God for that. But what it's come to mean today is, zeal- is it's just a zealousness. And most often, the people that are religious are lost and they're zealous for a lie. So now you have 40 fasting and conspiring men who didn't have a clue that it wasn't Paul alone they were coming against, but that the Lord is with him. Amen? Did we not just see that in the previous verse? We're going to kill him. You're not going to do anything unless God allows it. Jesus promised Paul he would go to Rome, and these 40 Jews conspired that they would not eat until he died. Verse 14, then came the chief priests and the elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. So they tell the the Sadducees, they tell the religious leaders that we're not going to eat or drink until that man's dead. You got to be pretty angry to get there. And what has made them angry? That Paul would say that Jesus is the Lord. Paul has not taken away their livelihood. Paul has not attacked them physically. All he's done is tell them the truth, and it's caused them to be stirred up. Verse 15, now you therefore, together with this council, suggest to the commander that if you brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So they're coming up with a plan saying, go tell him you want to talk to him again, and then we'll be hiding along the way, and we'll jump out and kill Paul when he's coming to be for you to speak to him. You know, men plan and God laughs. Amen? The reality is God is in control, not men. Your plans won't do anything if they're not inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they can come up with a plan to ambush Paul, but you can't ambush God. Amen? Isn't it good to know? Again, even when trials will think, man, if I'd done this different, and why did this happen, or I can't believe this, God is in control. God is faithful. Now watch. It's just going to, here comes a divine appointment. It says there, so when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Do you think there was a, just by chance that Paul's nephew was sitting there listening to them conspire to kill his uncle? Did God put him there? Does he hear it? Is God going to use him? He's just standing there. He runs and tells Paul, hey, Paul, I got something to tell you, bro. They got 40 guys say they ain't going to eat till you're dead, and they got a plan to ambush you when you're along the road. Really? Paul's been doing nothing but get beaten. Now he's got 40 guys who won't eat till he's dead. And Paul knows about it. Look at verse 17. Now Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you, if he has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they're going to inquire more fully about him, but not to yield to them, but do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, many who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting waiting for the promise from you. So God is going to take a divine appointment, an opportunity, and he speaks to this young man. By the way, it says he takes him by the hand. I think this is a very young boy. You don't grab an 18-year-old man by the hand and lead him aside, unless you want to get popped or something, right? So I think this is a young boy. He grabs him by the hand. Come here, what is it you want to tell me? I don't know how young he was. I think he's a young man. And he tells him, and God's going to use this young man, this divine appointment, this opportunity to over, you know, overhear the truth, And notice what it says here, how the commander responds. Verse 22, so the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. So when you stand for the Lord, there are going to be those that want you to be quiet. And sadly, in most of the world, that's the country you're living in. A lot of countries have all but out, there's countries that have outlawed Christianity that make it so difficult for you to speak the truth. Our country now, if I hear separation of church and state misapplied one more time, Lord help me. Amen? Because you know separation of church and state was not to protect the state from the church, but the church from the state. And it's nowhere in the Constitution. Can we say amen to that? 
It's contrary to what the word, it's, it, n- protect the church from the state. And you know why? Because the state is showing why we need protection from them. Amen? Let's get that in God we trust down. Let's take down those crosses. Don't be talking about Jesus. You, can't have, you can teach anything in school but the Bible. You can teach there's 500 uh, genders, but you can't teach the Bible. You can teach any nonsense you want. You can teach the good of the zoo to you, evolution, the lie of the devil. You can teach that, but you can't teach the Bible. So we live in a world today that attacks the truth of the word of God, and when you speak the truth, there are gonna be those who want you to shut up. You know why? Because it's convicting. Amen? The cross of Christ is a stone of offense. You can talk about just about anything, and you start talking about Jesus, and people get, don't they? I don't want to talk about that. You know why? Well, if I don't hear it, I'm not accountable. You're accountable anyway. And so here's this picture. They want to silence Paul because how dare he stand up for the truth. So finally, not only sharing the truth will produce division. As you share the truth, you'll be encouraged by the Lord. There will be those who try to silence the message, but finally, with divine calling also comes divine protection. Look what happens here. And watch how God uses these men, these soldiers, who are not believers, but he's gonna use them for his, to, to bring about his perfect will. It says there in verse 23, and he called two of the centurions and said, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. Paul is going to go to Caesarea, and there he's going to have yet another audience to share the gospel. And now these 40 guys are going to be hiding in the bushes, maybe with sticks or spear, whatever they've got. And then Paul's going to, can you just see the picture when Paul's entourage turns the corner? These 40 guys are in the bushes hiding, 200 soldiers. Look what it says besides the 200 soldiers. It says 200 soldiers, and then it says 70 horsemen. So 200 soldiers on feet, marching fully decked out, armor on, swords, spears ready to go. 200, uh, uh, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. 200 guys with spears. 470 people protecting Paul, and all of them armed to the teeth and trained. And 40 Religious guys in the bushes waiting to attack him who said they wouldn't eat again. You guys are dead. You're toast. Guys, if God is for us, who can be against us? And God can use even worldly means to bring up protection for his people. You know, God supernaturally provided earthly tools, and we need to know that when we pray. You know, if you have a brain tumor, Should we pray that God would remove it? What's the answer? Should we pray that God would supernaturally heal? Could God also use a brain surgeon? And we pray for them all. Amen? And we trust God that he wants to use a brain surgeon? Praise God. Maybe God's going to use that to touch it. I don't know. Let God, you know, we pray and we trust God. Is God smarter than us? What's the answer? We're all idiots compared to God, right? So God's smart. We pray, we put it in his hands and praise God that often our greatest learning comes through the process. You know, sometimes he could just, he could heal us all immediately, but often he allows us to go through the process of being healed over time or going through the trials and difficulties because he's more concerned about our character than he is our comfort, amen? He wants to mold us into the image of our Savior. And if it means that we have to go through some suffering to get there, then bring it on. Amen? You hear me say it often. Show me something the Bible used greatly that didn't suffer greatly. There aren't any. So he wrote the following letter. He wrote a letter in the following matter. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix. Greeting. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, was about to be killed by them, coming with their troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. Well, first of all, he's kind of lying there. Did he rescue him the first time? No, but okay. Have you ever noticed how people, when you tell a story, you always put yourself in the best light possible? Okay. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. 
I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told to me that the Jews lie in wait for, their, for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. So here's a man, Claudius Lysias portrays himself again the best possible light. He, may, he ne- neglects to mention that he falsely bound Paul and was about to beat him to death. Kind of left that out. You remember that? Paul, can you beat me? Oh yeah, I guess I shouldn't do that. He had also mistaken his identity as an Egyptian assassin. Do you remember that? Aren't you the assassin who brought up, aren't you the Egyptian that brought up 400 assassins? So, okay. But he had rescued him through God rescues him through this earthly tool by the hand of God, and he declares Paul innocent, no crime. There's no crime for being a Christian, though, again, quickly approaching today. He was persecuted, though innocent, but the persecution brought about divine appointments. And now Paul's lack of safety moved the case to Caesarea. Guess what's going to happen? He has to be moved for his safety, but what's waiting on the other side? What do you think? Another divine appointment. By the way, if you've ever been to Israel, Caesarea is beautiful. And there's the, there's the ruins there where Paul was under house arrest for two years, and it's right on the water. It's beautiful. And there's a big, huge, you know, uh, like a co- half coliseum. I forget what that's called again. A- what's it called? Amphitheater. amphitheater, that's it. There's a huge amphitheater there that is still there where Paul would then get up and he's gonna to speak to another huge crowd. So look, every time Paul was persecuted, it was another opportunity for the gospel. Guys, no suffering is wasted, amen? And no suffering in our lives is wasted either. It's a part of our testimony. It can be used for the kingdom of God. Finally, let's finish up and we'll go to our time of communion. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipartus. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. And when he came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers and when your accusers have also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Paul spent two years of protective custody on the beach, and I think that he was deserving of a beach rest right about now. Can you say amen? Does God care about the details? The guy's been getting beat on for a long time, and now he's going to be in a place of safety and rest. But you know what? Those same people are going to come, but now they're going to have to listen. Where they were smacking him in the mouth and quieting him, now they're going to be standing before the authorities, and we're going to see in the coming chapters that Paul's going to get to get up and share the gospel with yet another great crowd. Again, wouldn't you have quit by now? Wouldn't you just say, I'm just going to go home and live on the beach. I'm done. Can I just stay here? But you know what? None of these things were going to move him. Amen? Paul said it in Acts 20, none of these things move me. And the last three chapters, he's proved it. Amen? It's one thing to say, we'll stand for the Lord. and It's another thing to do it. It's one thing to say that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's another thing to live like it. Can we say amen? And the real key is, it's got to go beyond something you do out of obligation to something you do because you love the Lord. Amen? I love to introduce people to my wife because I love my wife. And they're always blown away that an ugly mug like me married a pretty girl like her. (laughs) More proof that there is a God. Outkick my coverage. But the reality is, I love my wife, and it's not a drudgery to introduce people to my wife. I love to introduce people to my wife. But you know what? I love Jesus more than I love my wife, and it shouldn't be a drudgery to introduce people to Jesus. Can we say amen to that? But sometimes we're afraid. Sometimes we become fearful because we lose sight of the motivation behind sharing our faith. Guys, we're indestructible until God's through with us. Be daring in the will of God. Look for Jesus in the midst of the storm. Look for opportunities to share your faith. What are you bound to this morning? He was was bound by love. What binds you this morning? 
Did you grow up overwhelmed? Did you grow up in a place where you were guilted? If I don't go to church, I'm going to go, you know, you just, and there's this heavy law on your back and you're just doing this out of legal obligation? Or do you come here because you love the Lord and you can't wait to, to worship him, to spend time in his presence, to praise his name, to be in fellowship with other believers? Amen? amen. Two different things, amen? So, bound by love, not by law. Sharing the truth will produce division. As you share the truth, you'll be encouraged by the Lord. There will be those who try to silence the message. And with divine calling comes divine protection.